Welcome back to my countdown of my favourite Diamond League events. We are going to go through the second half today, so if you're a big fan of Gateshead in New York, you'd be better off watching the first one. I'll put a link somewhere if I can ever figure out how YouTube works. The Meeting de Paris, which used to be known as the Meeting Arriva and Meeting Gaz de France, is these days held at the... oh boy, I'm, I'm sorry French people in advance. The Stade Sébastien Charletti. Um, having previously been held at the Stade de France. Um, Paris has a long history of hosting world-class athletics, and this is a Grand Prix which has roots back to the 1980s. There have been some great performances over the years. Usain Bolt, Hicham al Garouj, Jan Zelezny, Elaine Thompson are among those to have held meeting records, as is Tonique Williams. I got a bit distracted there. Um, this is a Grand Prix that is usually simply pretty good and that is held in a densely packed part of the season. It is one that I've been to and in my mind it is on absolutely equal par with London. Now you cannot accuse me of home bias, this being my home Grand Prix and the one I've been to more than any other and yeah I'm only putting it equal sixth. I adored Crystal Palace when the Grand Prix was held at that venue and it is a tragedy that that stadium has now been neglected to the extent it has. It was the perfect size, Crystal Palace, for hosting an event of this magnitude, and the walk through the park to the old stadium was just the athletics experience that I grew up to associate. I'm getting pretty fired up now actually, and I might even do a second video about Crystal Palace itself. It was here I got my first taste of world athletics, and it was where I saw Yelena Isinbayeva break one of her early world records in 2004. It's been brilliant to have the Olympic Stadium used for the Grand Prix since 2013 and also as a host venue to the World Championships in 2017. There have been some great performances and personal memories such as Kendra Harrison's world record from 2016 are among highlights for athletics in general for me. I think the quality of this event has suffered from being spread over two days. There were often non-Diamond League events where home heroes such as Mo Farah I lined up against local athletes and their training partners to attempt world records at obscure distances. Taking away my own home bias, the quality on offer is probably about on par with Paris, and I'd say they're both about sixth. But this event will not be held in 2022, it's absent from the calendar and its future looks uncertain, with West Ham United's very important club games in July, leading to owners pressing British athletics to take their signature Grand Prix elsewhere. Ten years on from London 2012, the London Anniversary Games looks like being one of those events we don't celebrate anymore, like May Day or Ed Balls Day. It makes me so annoyed that the legacy of the Olympics has been dented and that we no longer have world athletics in London. And it's all because of a corporate situation which could have been prevented. But as I say, this is another issue for a future profanity-filled video. Next on the list is one I struggle to pronounce, but not because of the French lingo. It's the Prefontaine Classic. It says something about the overall quality of this event, that I'm prepared to rank it so highly, even when it's one I have to stay up into the early hours to watch live. It feels like athletics taken seriously and done right, with a lot of effort put in year after year to make track and field look serene and professional. The weather is usually gorgeous, and it is the event most of the quality American runners and field athletes will target, making for some great times, heights and distances. As a non-American seeing the USA topping the athletics medal table year after year after year after year, it can seem as tedious as Man United's monopoly on the Premier League in the late 2000s, but I'm actually excited that this will be the venue for the 2022 World Championships, even if it means the host nation will probably sweep the board. Although they were awarded this championship in a way that was a bit iffy, but I do not have anything bad to say about the Prefontaine Classic. From its distances, being confusingly measured in feet and inches, to the gravel pit used for the shot put, it feels like a celebration of all that is good about American athletics. Now, come on, the top four were never in doubt, to be honest. It was only ever going to be which order I put these in, Let's be honest. Choosing between these four was like deciding between children I don't yet have, and now we're going to be entering the god tier of Diamond League events. 
And at four, I've gone for Oslo. I've not been to the Bislett Games, but I feel like I have. The stadium, the surroundings, it's all so familiar. I remember when the BBC first got rights to broadcast the Diamond League and being blown away by the history, the culture and the atmosphere, which really made this event stand out. The excitement that builds around this Grand Prix is infectious and it is top of the bucket list for Diamond League meetings I would like to attend. It's been held since the 1960s and in the golden era of British middle distance running, it was the scene for the world records by Dave Moorcroft, Seb Coe and Steve Ovette. More recently, in the great renaissance of Norwegian athletics, Karsten Vorholm has set a world record here, as has everybody's favourite De Barber sister. Then there is the Dream at Mile, a meeting so prestigious that it has its own Wikipedia page. I love Oslo. It is only slightly let down by its weather, but then, if it was always sunny, the event wouldn't quite have the same character. At three is my favourite Swiss event on the Diamond League calendar, Zurich. The One Day Olympics, as it is sometimes known, is usually one of the most looked forward to events on the Diamond League calendar. Athletes love competing here, and there is an almost 100 year history at the Weltklasse, as the event is known, with an ever capacity crowd at the Letzigrün Stadium. Once known as the Nürmi meeting after the legendary Finnish runner, this is an event which has seen 25, by my count, world records. This includes in 1997, when two runners, both called Wilson Kip Keita, ran world records. That must be a world record in its own right. Honestly, the list of great previous winners is too long for this video. It's a who's who of athletics. So why have I only put it at number three? For whatever reason, this meeting seems to have lost some of its je ne sais quoi for the absolute top times and distances to be set. The last world record was in 2009 at the hands and pole of Yelena, who must have set a record in every stadium in the world apart from Tunbridge. But before then, it was Asafa Powell who I'm wondering, is, is he still competing? Like, as a side note, let, let me know if, if Asafa Powell is still going. Since the formation of the Diamond League, there has not been a world record, but there has been one Diamond League record set by a man who is an ever present at this meeting. Karim Hussain. Nah, only kidding, it was this guy, Juan Miguel Echevarria. I love Zurich, and if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably have this one as number one. Um, but since you didn't ask me tomorrow and you asked me today, I'll probably tell you number two on my list is Monaco. I have been to Monaco, but never to see athletics. Unlike its Formula One equivalent, the meeting Hercules is simply the fastest Grand Prix going. An unmatched four world records have been set here since 2010. Josh Cheptegei, Safan Hassan, Beatrice Kipcharic, and amazingly, the one set the longest time ago, Ginzebe de Barber. Oh, and for good measure, in 2008, there was a world record set by... Yeah, you, you get the point. But as well as that, there have been some astonishing times set here and it must be the fastest place in the world to run. Nine current Diamond League records have been set here, including Brimim Kipruto's steeplechase record, which missed the world record by thousands. Why is Monaco so fast? I'm guessing, having done absolutely no research on this, that it's the combination of the great weather, the track itself, and the quality of the lineups. Athletes now come to Monaco expecting to at least get a season's best, which is surely a factor which could give an athlete a psychological boost. And one of the certainties of athletics is that every year, usually in lane one, Bryce Itez will line up in the men's 800 metres. The only reason why it's just number two is the smaller crowd sizes when compared to Brussels. The greatest comes last. There is a final day of school vibe about this one. It just feels fun. There's so much going on with all the Diamond League trophies up for grabs and amazing action everywhere you look, in front of a usually rammed King Badoon Stadium. The Memorial Van Damme was first held in 1977 in honour of Ivo Van Damme, a runner who died the previous year. It is an event which could make anyone fall in love with athletics. This is what late August, early September is about. There have not been as many world records as Monaco, even Yelena Isambayeva never set one here. What? What? 
but there have been incredible performances nonetheless, with Johan Blake's 19.26200 meters a personal highlight, and who knew, Daryl Hill set the meet record here for the shot put. The only downside to the whole thing is that there is no athletics after this. This is the final event of the year, which leaves me with with jaw symptoms and leaves me looking forward to Doha the following May. So as ever, let me know if you agree or disagree in the comments and if you like athletics and YouTube, you'll know by now that there are many, many channels out there that are better than this one. I will see you next time. Oh, and if you're Bryce Tez, I will see you in lane one in Monaco.